I was talking about my time working for Polar Gas, which was really arranged through Bill Kemp. It was a project that, it was socioeconomic impact studies. They were doing them along what was to be the pipeline route, which never happened. Uh, so there were people working in Arvia and Old Spence Bay, Tolojoak. Uh, but I, uh, it got me to places like Grease Fjord and Arctic Bay as well. But basically, I did work in Resolute. It was a small place. I only worked with the Inuit, so there were 120, 25 people, a little bit bigger than Grease Fjord at the time. And there was a woman there who had married in from Clyde. So I had a little bit of a contact because I knew her family in Clyde. But I heard about this family down on Somerset Island, and it was an elderly man who, when I first went there, had to be, it was hard to tell, he was in his 70s. He, uh, and he had a, it was actually his second family. His first family, except for his oldest son, had died in an avalanche. So he had his wife, his second wife, who was about 30, 40 years younger than he was, 30 years, I would say and maybe four relatively young children, just entering adolescence, the oldest, maybe 13, 14, 15. And so I spent a lot of time just to stay out of Resolute. And uh, so his name was Illau, originally from towards Arctic Bay Way. And he and his whole family, he was brought, were brought to Pond Inlet for the Jane's murder trial. And um, as he told me, they were so traumatized by what happened <clears throat> that they moved to Boothia Peninsula uh, near Fort Ross and brought us Lee Inlet. And uh, one of the interesting things he, he said to me was, he, coming from North Baffin, you ran big dog teams like a Glulik and so on. He said when they got there, they met for the first time Netzelingmut and that the Netzelik were so poor, they only had two or three dogs. He said they had heard about, he had heard about people like this, but he didn't believe that there were Inuit who were so poor. And uh, I tried to pin down when this was, I mean the Jane's murder trial, but how old he was. He said he hadn't married yet, so I figure he was 14, 15 maybe, because people married, still married young when I came to Clyde. Men were 16, 17. Women, 14, might have their first child when they were 15, as they still do. That was one of the interesting things from my daughter was she, one day she turned, to, maybe I mentioned this, she turned to me and she, as, she, as I said, uh, she said, uh, you know, not everyone thinks about having children when you're young, like we do. And she thought this was a very good thing. And, and I think, I really think that experience when she came to Clyde kind of pushed her into anthropology. It wasn't intentional. I just wanted to take her when she was old enough to really remember it. But uh, for me, it was, that's when I decided to start also <coughs> beginning to recruit women's students to work on more women's oriented, what I considered when women's oriented projects for the reasons I gave you. I just didn't think it was appropriate for any number of reasons for men to work with women and women to work with men because the jealousy goes both ways. Anyway, uh, so I worked more on and off through Resolute for about three years, I guess 1975, 76, 77, something like that. And I basically did stuff on harvesting, uh, but I always was doing kinship and social organization. And Resolute was kind of a crazy place because you had all the people from Quebec, from uh, 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 Richmond Gulf, and people from Pond Inlet. And I didn't go back for many years. And actually when I started to do pol polar bear sport hunt research and found the same resentment still existed when I went back, and that was around 2000, 
when I started that work. And I, I'll get to that later on, how it manifests itself. But uh, it was clear that there was not a lot of love lost. There was some marriage between groups, even less at Grease Fjord. Milton Freeman knows much more about Grease Fjord than I do because his brother-in-law was up in Grease Fjord at that time. Uh, I can't remember his name. Minnie's brother, Minnie Adler's brother. But uh, so Milton was up there much more. I was only in Greece for a couple, three, four times. But Idla was fascinating. Um, if for little things, he, he kept dogs differently than, like at Clyde, never thought anything about beating a dog. And Idla taught me, he always had his dog staked down, probably because the threat of polar bears was much less. That's why all the dogs were lucid, but uh, at Kuganiuk, uh, he saw me kick a dog once, and the only time he ever admonished me was, uh, he, he said to me, always hit a dog with your hand, that way you know how, hard it, uh, how much it hurts. Things like that. I mean, and I'd never seen a Ninuk be so nice to dogs, actually. But uh, again, there were life lessons to come out of all of that. Uh, I have to admit, I lost a great deal of any fondness for dogs when I lived at Abatiuk. <laughs> God, what a pain in the neck, <laughs> feeding them. <laughs> and when they would get away, when you had to fix the traces and they would disappear, phew, spend three hours trying to find your dogs. So, but uh, probably I, the biggest mid-career stuff was the work I did on the ceiling protest. Uh, and that grew out of a project that wasn't intended to be about sealing. It was about 1979. I wanted to go back and do a study of the municipal council at Clyde. It was a fairly new phenomenon because the settlement manager used to run everything. But he had a, a committee of elders from six of the seven extended families that he would consult with. And then he would turn their ideas into English and float them to Frobisher Bay to see, and half the time nothing, things didn't go anywhere, but Herb Hunt was his name, and he was a really good fellow. And he was married to Enoch from Dorset. But, uh, so I wanted to do this study, but I also wanted to see friends, and about four of my closest friends were, weren't in town, and they weren't out hunting, they were at Nana Civic Mine. None of these guys had ever worked before. And so I, I stayed around. I never did this study on the municipal council, actually. Uh, I had a pretty good idea how things operated from times before. I, mostly I was interested in how the families worked out issues in the community. And that was through the elders. So the, when white people complained that you could, it was like reading Hugh Brody's uh, The People's Land. Uh, by the way, I'm. Brody and I didn't meet for years, but he was in Miti Matadik when I was in Clyde, and our families used to write about each other. To, they would send letters to each other about Hugh, how he spoke in Nutitu, and how I ate seal all the time, <laughs> type of stuff. And, uh, and, and we met later here at McGill when he was doing some sessional teaching. I forget what he was doing. I was a grad student. But around, uh, yeah, I guess it was about 78, I kind of canned the municipal project. I was really curious about these guys' experiences at Nana Civic and why the hell they went to Nana Civic. From everything I heard, it was not a great, a great place. I mean, I don't know what the mining operations are like today, but they certainly were not a, in, in, very enlightened in the 1970s. And uh, uh, they came back and I, what they told me was, well, they went, they went to make money because they Seal skins were va had no value. That was a year that seals crashed. It was before the European protest. But it, it, someplace here, I probably, I used to have a chart. Oh, if you look up there, you can see the years where things move around in terms of uh, the pricing of seals and, and the harvest. It had an effect on the harvest as well. Hunting still takes money, no matter why. Once you mechanized, even though skidoos were not costly, and by the way, when I lived at Abatiuk, I negotiated their first snowmobile. They bought it secondhand from the RCMP because it didn't have a lot of mileage on it. 
and I got him a deal for $500 for a snowmobile. I think new snowmobiles were only about $1,000 in those days. But an old two-banger, God. You could take the engine out and bring it inside to work on it. It was great. You didn't have to stand outside and freeze. But uh, so that put me on to the idea. What's going on around the SEAL protest? I, you know, I knew that there was a protest around Labrador and the Maritimes. I had no idea that this had an effect on Inuit. So that's how I got into this sealing stuff. Most of it at North. And, and then when Canada organized the uh, uh, Royal Commission on Seals and the Seal Industry in Canada, Justice Maloof took me on as the northern person. I actually wanted to work in Newfoundland. I wanted to go out on a Newfoundland sealer. But I can't remember who did that. Maybe nobody ever went out, actually, because I do things participant observation. And Inuit always talked very highly about Newfoundlanders to me. They felt that of all the white people they met, they had a grasp of Inuit life. They worked with their hands, they fished, they hunted. And a lot of people had gone down there for heavy machine training and stuff, boat training, when big boats were starting to come in. Uh, but anyway, so I had the northern uh, job with Justice Maloof, who was a really great guy, really tough. Boy, was he tough. I really enjoyed working with him. And that was, about, to be honest, my last really long bout of field research. I did about nine months in Clyde, and then about two months in Ulahatuk, and about two or three months in Greenland, mostly in Nuuk, looking through the archives, because they do have the great Greenland records there, uh, the Royal Greenlandic Trading Company. And that was an experience, too. I mean, Greenland was nothing like Nunavut. I certainly Nuke wasn't. I was just stunned. I always wanted to take people from Clyde back, especially around wildlife regulations, because Greenland is so different. Anyway, uh, the sealing research primarily uh, focused, my focus was working with Inuit, uh, and all the aspects of, of sealing, that, that it wasn't just about killing seals and eating them, basically. Although I think the fellow from, uh, who lived at Kugarak, I can't remember his name, who wrote a, a, a small book about seals. Did a, he was a journalist, freelance, it's not someplace on a shelf. We can look for it later. He did a wonderful job, particularly about the uh, cosmology and so on. <coughs> One of the things I should say is I've never gotten into sort of Inuit ideology. Um, I'm not a, like, a person who likes to have that side of me probed. And I've always carried over into my field work. I don't do what I don't want done to me. So I very rarely would take photographs. And I probably have not taken a camera north since 1980. And the last camera I had is still sitting on a small island in an ammunition box because I had to get out fast and I just packed it and put it in a cache and I left it. And there's an old Nikon F sitting up there somewhere. <laughs> so you can tell I'm not a photographer. <laughs> and I'm not very comfortable taking pictures of people, although lots of people have given me permission. And usually they're either a family shot or they're with one of my graduate students when I had a graduate student with me in Clyde. Or often, I mean, I would go in with my philosophy with students was I would go in with them, introduce them, stay with them for a month, and then they had to find their way. Because otherwise, they were just like my tail. People would always talk to me. about. They could ask a question, but they would answer to me. And that's not right. So anyway, I digress. But by about 19, 1971, I would say, I started picking up the rumors that the whole focus of the SEAL protest was going to be to Europe. I actually wrote to Indian Affairs about this. And I said, you guys better get on the stick because things are going to change. And it's, you know, Canada is one thing. There was no audience for SEALs in the States. I mean. They didn't buy seal skins. They had their own seal hunt in the Pribloffs. It was run by the U.S. government. 
You know, no, not many people know that. But uh, the U.S. government funded a seal call, and they split the proceeds between, it was uh, a treaty from about 1912 with Russia, Canada because of Britain, and Japan. Uh, and it, the idea was to cut down on the bycatch of seals from commercial fishing in the Bering Strait. So I don't know how I got this rumor. Maybe it was from somebody at Fisheries and Oceans. I don't know. Can't remember anymore. So I started to just pay more attention to it. Back in 1968, I wrote this very naive article about, you know, because uh, that was the, in 78 was the year my friends went to Nana Civic and there was a crash in the seal price dropped to a couple of dollars. From at that time, it was probably up to about <coughs> 12, 13 dollars. Hadn't peaked yet. That came a bit later. But uh, it was down to two, 250. And it, so guys were having a hard time going hunting. <coughs> and because even skidoos in those days, you know, fuel, oil, all those things cost money. And the bay never, <laughs> you know, it was pretty tough. So, uh, uh, I wrote, this, I wrote this article that naively suggested that if people only understood how necessary it was for Inuit, you know, I alluded to identity, but the, the funniest thing about that article was if you look at the bibliography, I have a citation to Bridget Bardot, because she wrote a seal book about the seal hunt. And if you look at the illustrations, all the hunters look like Inuit. They're wearing hooded jackets and so on. And so I sent her a copy of the article and asked her for an autographed photo from God Created Women, and she never sent it to me. <laughs> so I no longer watch movies by Bardot. <laughs> but uh, so that's when I decided that the public's not really interested in what I do. <laughs> but uh, so I began to pay more attention to, to really look into the SEAL protests. And then things blew up in Europe. CBC did the, I don't know if you ever saw the documentary film, uh, All Things Bright and Beautiful and Canadians Kill Them All. It was a CBC documentary, mostly set in Newfoundland, about the SEAL protest. Yeah. But there was, a, I think there was a little bit about it anyway. I used to have a videotape and I loaned it to somebody because I had copied it. And when, uh, when I was working for Maluf, I took it to, up with me to Echelut, and we had a Inuktitut voiceover done. And we, in those days, television had come in, uh, and telephone, and on the satellite, Anik 1. And, but you could detach the satellite and use it as a huge VCR. And we beamed it into the houses, and then did radio phone in afterward. And it was really interesting. I mean, Inuit about how ethnocentric they could be, how awful it was that they clubbed seals and they didn't seem to eat them, you know? And plus there was all this stuff about the Europeans and so on and so forth. I interviewed, uh, uh, there was a, 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 a woman from the, a German woman from the European Parliament, parliamentarian here, interviewed her. And that kind of got me, it was convenient here. So I wound up getting a research grant to do some of this. Mostly working with people from uh, Greenpeace, from uh, the International Fund for Animal Welfare. They, I found the Greenpeace people absolutely sincere. You know, uh, I never got them, but as I, I, I got to meet with people after Paul Watson had left. I still have a letter from Paul Watson. I had written to him to get an interview, but I had sent him some questions, much like you sent me the script. And I still have the letter someplace here. He wrote back about how, because what I wrote to him about was, well, why do you include Inuit in the SEAL protest? And he said, well, they've been co-opted by the fur trade and they don't do it for traditional reasons. The whole thing was, Inuit aren't traditional anymore. They use snowmobiles and stuff. Well, Christ, you, if you're living in these centralized communities, well, I wrote about this in the SEAL book, you know, it's different. When we lived at Abatayuk, we never went more than an hour or an hour and a half to seal hunt. We were living by the seals. We were just on shore. By dog team, we traveled an hour and a half, so we went six, eight kilometers maybe, much longer to polar bear hunt, unless they came to camp. But, uh, but in Clyde, you had a trip of at least 30 kilometers 
And part of that was across the land. So you're looking at five, six hours of travel one way. You, you can't keep up hunting that way. So when the snowmobile came in, I'm sure other people have hypothesized different reasons, but it made perfect sense to take the snowmobile and adapt it to what you needed. Now, you've seen how people modify snowmobiles, paint the front white, or we would put a teluak, a screen on the front to hunt seals when they're up on the ice, when they were utuk. Uh, and people were just the most incredible mechanics. Nobody could read English, but they could take a snowmobile apart and put it together. Uh, a little story about, I, I've always, I knew Inuit were incredible problem solvers from my time at Abatiuk, but I was out with a guy, I guess we were about 50 kilometers or so from Clyde and we broke our track. I mean, we were stuck. It was a long walk, 50 kilometers in March. And uh, so we were making tea and he, we were kicking around ideas. How do you fix a track? And he said, you got any fan belts? And I said, yeah, I got about three. And my, my snowmobile was broken down anyway. We had it on the Comet Dick, his Comet Dick. We left mine on an island. And uh, he said, get the fan belts. And we had the Coleman going. We had lots of Coleman fuel. Take a screwdriver, heat it, and melt a hole in the track. And we stripped the fan belts, and we tied the track together. And we could go 8, 10 kilometers really slowly, and it would break. And we'd do it again, and do it again, and do it again. It was phenomenal. It was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. And I mean, even seal hunting, when I got to Abatiuk, I had rifles, mainly a 222. In those days, people only had a 303 from the Rangers, a 222, which they used for almost all hunting, polar bear, caribou, and maybe a 22. But I found that I was having a hell of a time shooting seals, especially when they were in the water. You have to shoot them in the head. And what I didn't realize, when you have the V sight, nobody had telescopic sights in those days. They hadn't been introduced yet. You couldn't see the seal's head through the bead on the front. And what Inuit did to my rifle, but all their rifles were this way, I just hadn't noticed it. They took a hammer, knocked off the hind sight, took a nail, flattened it, put a scratch on it, and then sighted it in. And you could see the seal's head. I thought, you know, taking a good piece of technology and making it a hell of a lot better for the circumstances. And I've always found that, and I'm sure if I paid more attention and really thought about it, I could think of things that don't have anything to do with technology about how they've adapted the system of governance in the communities. Like when I first came, the council was elders. It was the settlement manager was very perceptive man he Herb Hunt, but you know they could not actually put ideas forward to the government to the GNWT, but Herb would do it, and he spoke in Uh He hunted with people. He was from Newfoundland actually. I think he was probably one of the few Newfoundlanders they first met. So, but anyway, I digress as usual. I apologize. Uh, so I started interviewing people from Greenpeace, uh, World Wildlife Fund, um, International Fund for Animal Welfare. I almost had a fist fight with a guy from the International Fund for Animal Welfare. He was the most, excuse me, obtuse person I've ever met. Abs just, it was a money-making operation. I may, that may sound libelous, but I was convinced that for it, whatever they believed about animals, they were making a bundle. Greenpeace people, I thought, were incredibly sincere. Mis misplaced uh, sincerity, but uh, so I spent probably from basically 1978 to about 1970, uh, 1988 or so just doing research and being funded through the, the Royal Commission, and I was always doing projects. And anything that got, even when I worked for Polar Gas, I always built in a trip to Clyde. Not that it had anything to do with Polar Gas, but hey, they were laying out millions of dollars. They could afford the airfare. 
So I would have some excuse for going to Clyde River. And, uh, and that's what culminated in the book, which I did actually on a handshake in a bar, agreed to do this book for a small press in England. A friend of mine here uh, knew, I think he knew the editor from grad school, because this place was really Brit, <laughs> Miguel. <laughs> when I came, I think I was the only American in the department, <laughs> and that was as a graduate student. They were all from Cambridge and Oxford, and <coughs> or, the, or the colonies. Anyway, uh, he, he introduced me to his friend, and we were actually at the jazz club that used to be run by... Uh, Oh, my memory's failing me. Terminal senility, I apologize. Just a few blocks away. And we were pretty drunk. And he, I was talking this up. It was Peter Rusher, the guy from the department, John Bradbury, his friend from this press in England, and me. And we had probably been drinking for a couple of hours. And the guy said, oh, this is really interesting stuff. You want to do a book for us? And I said, yeah, sure. And I didn't think anything about it. Six months later, he wrote to me and said, how are you coming on the manuscript? I hadn't started it. And so I started, and then I, it's when I actually, as a side piece here, when I finally got a computer, because I was losing pages, I couldn't keep things straight. So I had an old Zenith laptop with a control disk. You had to switch disks around. And I got to about page 90 in the manuscript, and, and the computer froze. And I was on the phone to a tech in California for about three hours in the middle of the day. And finally he said, well, did you try saving it? And I said, oh, yeah, I, I hit save. And he said, well, shut it off and turn it back on and see if there's anything there. I had about 90 pages of manuscript. I was ready to give up the whole project. And I lost just what I had typed that day. And then I decided I needed a better computer <laughs> with more, <laughs> more memory. <laughs> I don't know, it was like, you know, 156 or something, <laughs> or three. I don't know what the memory was in that damn thing. I still have it someplace. And, uh, but, uh, so, um, you know, the book, but the, even around the book, there's a bit of a story because along with friends reading it here, and I, especially a woman named Sherry Olson, who was here in the department. She's long retired now. She did a wonderful job proofreading it. Um, but when I sent it to the publisher, they put out blurbs, pre-publication pre blur blurbs, and they were a libel suit was brought against the press and me by Greenpeace International. And uh, I was away in Yellowknife at the time. I forget what I was doing in Yellowknife. Oh, I was working for National Research Council for a bit as a consultant. And I came back and there were all these, in those days it was faxes basically, about, you know, we're being sued and yada, yada, yada. Well, it all turned out, basically, they wanted the manuscript. And I knew once they got the manuscript, it was going to go to all these other organizations that were named in the book. And it would never get published. It was just going to become a nightmare dragging out. And the European Parliament was supposed to meet the coming year to re-up the ban. And I wanted the book out before the ban was going to be dis debated again for whatever debate they gave it. And uh, so I, I refused to allow the manuscript. I told the press I would withdraw it. And uh, the... Uh, um, Lawyers from McGill and lawyers from the press went through it, and that delayed publication almost right up to the time that the parliament met. And it came down to eight word changes in the whole thing, and it went through. There was some ramifications afterwards, but I, that's a story maybe for later. Did it have the same title, Animal Rights, Human Rights, or not yet? No, I had titled it Economy, Ecology, and Ideology in the Canadian Arctic. And the publisher wanted animal rights.